All right, good evening, everyone. We're ready to get started. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Edward Wolcher. I'm the curator of lectures at Town Hall Seattle, and on behalf of Town Hall, our partners at the Elliott Bay Book Company, who are set up in the lobby, and our host tonight at Seattle University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, star-studded panel tonight uh, with Ashley Nellis and Steve Herbert, moderated by Catherine Beckett. Uh, talking about this critical issue of uh, mass incarceration and life sentences. Uh, I'm really happy that we had this on our calendar uh, uh, while, we, while we could and in this sort of weird moment when we're about to see what Congress has for us in terms of criminal justice reform and what bipartisan criminal justice reform looks like. And we can hear from folks who've been really doing some of the most profound work on thinking critically about the criminal justice system and maybe compare and contrast some of the proposals that we see. Uh, so the program tonight is presented by Town Hall as part of our Civic Series, uh, as well as our Inside Out Series, our series of programs we've been doing while our space has been closed. I'm happy to report uh, that actually we are pretty much done with our Inside Out Series. This is the last program we have this calendar year, and Town Hall will be reopening early next year in March, so keep an eye out for a big announcement of an exciting new season of programs, including much more serious panel discussions <laughs> like the, tonight, and a lot of good fun music and exciting uh, celebration of our new space when we reopen in March of next year. Uh, but in the meantime, I should say that Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so thank you to the members in the room who make this all possible. Uh, lastly, I want to thank the wonderful community organizations who are set in the lobby. If you do advocacy work in Seattle, if you're interested in getting involved in grassroots organizing for um, social justice and, and particularly around prisons and prison reform, uh, there are some great organizations that you can connect with in the lobby. Uh, and after all the program is done tonight, we'll also be using the lobby for book signing. You can pick up copies of both books at the Elliott Bay table where you came in. Okay, now onto the program you're here to see tonight. So we're gonna hear, uh, we're gonna bring the panel up on stage, but then we're gonna hear two short presentations followed by a panel discussion and then audience Q&A. When we get to audience Q&A, please use the microphones on either side of the stage so that we can all hear you. Uh, but our panelists will, are the following. Ashley Nellis has a background analyzing criminal justice policies and practices and has extensive experience studying racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system. Her work elevates awareness about the growing number of individuals serving lengthy terms in, prisons, in prison, such as life sentences and sentences of life without parole. She is a senior research analyst with the Justice Reform Advocacy Group, The Sentencing Project, and has written numerous reports and publications to promote their mission. She is the author of A Return to Justice, Rethinking Our Approach to Juveniles and the Justice System, formerly. Steve Herbert is the Mark Torrance Professor and, and, uh, and Department Chair of Law, Societies, and Justice at the University of Washington. He's a geographer whose work focuses on exploring the relationship between the exercise of power and the control of space, particularly with respect to the work of urban police departments. He's the author of several books, including Policing Space, Territoriality in the Los Angeles Police Department, and The New Social Control in Urban America. Our moderator tonight is Catherine Beckett. Catherine is, the professor, is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Law Societies and Justice at the University of Washington. Her research analyzes the causes and consequences of legal changes and, pra and penal practices. And they're here tonight to discuss two books, Ashley's The Meaning of Life, The Case for Abolishing Life Sentences, and Steve's Too Easy to Keep, Life Sentence Prisoners and the Future of Mass Incarceration. Please join me in giving a warm town hall panel. Welcome to our panel. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. And thank you for um, arranging this event. Uh, we're, I'm really excited to be here and excited to talk about my favorite topic, uh, which is uh, life sentences in the United States. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our book, um, which is co-authored uh, by Mark Maurer, who's the executive director of the Sentencing Project. And uh, it was released last Tuesday, along with a national launch of a campaign to abolish life sentencing that is coming out of the Sentencing Project in Washington, DC. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how I got involved in the work um, <clears throat> that I do on life sentences. Um, 
the work of the sentencing project in life sentences uh, started in the early 2000s um, and was the first um, that we know of a state-based count of life sentences. To our knowledge, it had not been counted um, before, uh, although there were a couple of national counts of life sentences, the early of which was in the early 1980s, um, that put the status at about 34,000 people serving life sentences around the United States. But by and large, there was no official um, uh, justice count um, within the Bureau of Justice Statistics or somebody like that that was tracking life sentences. Um, and so, um, because uh, Mark uh, had done work in Michigan um, in the 80s, uh, particularly with people serving life sentences, he had the idea in the early 2000s to see sort of how many there were now. Um, and so we started a series of five, uh, what became five national studies of uh, people serving life sentences in all of the United States and the federal government. Um, I came to the work in 2008 with the second national count that we did um, <clears throat> that came in, uh, culminated in a report called No Exit. And shortly after that, um, the Supreme Court um, started to gather interest in, um, in life sentences for juveniles, having just abolished the death penalty for juveniles based on a knowledge about the adolescent brain being underdeveloped. And so I convinced Mark that we should uh, ask the juveniles who were serving life sentences uh, some critical questions about their childhood. And uh, at first he thought that that was um, unrealistic. Uh, there's 2,000 people, 2,500 people serving life sentences for crimes committed when they were under 18 around the United States. And to survey all of them would be quite an undertaking for our uh, eight-person staff at the sentencing project. Um, but I did talk him into it. Uh, we did a pen and paper survey um, to all of them. Uh, it was a 15-page, 75-question uh, survey, uh, asking them questions about their childhood, where they grew up, their childhood school experiences, uh, community violence, um, substance abuse, um, <clears throat> really focused on a lot of their lives except for um, you know, the crime. Because I, I'm not a litigator, I wasn't trying to build a case uh, to support them. I was trying to build context. Um, and so uh, ask them questions about um, how they, wh what they thought of the process, the legal process. Did they know what a life sentence was? How long did they think a life sentence was when they were given it? Many of them were uh, 16 years old or younger. Um, and as you might expect, uh, many of them did not think a life sentence was a life sentence. Um, they thought a life sentence was somewhere around 10 to 15 years. Um, so we asked them questions um, about their experience in prison, how many were put in general population when they were um, convicted and sentenced, how many um, had been in, spent time in solitary, um, several of them reported they were put in solitary for their own protection um, <clears throat> because they were so young. And then we asked them um, uh, whether they were engaged in any programming. And so what we learned from all of that is that the experience of lifers uh, when they came in uh, so young was very similar across all of them. A lot of them had experienced um, extreme abuse, extreme poverty, extreme neglect. Many of them were no longer living at home at the time of the crime. They were either li they were homeless, living with friends, living with distant relatives, kind of all over the place. Um, and their experience with uh, in prison was also remarkable in that uh, because of their life sentence, that many of them were excluded from programs, and yet they had come in in their late teens and had decades upon decades left to serve um, before they died. Um, so at the time of the release of this study was when the Supreme Court uh, picked up the case of um, Miller v. Alabama and ruled um, in favor of Miller. So they uh, abolished life sentences for juveniles who uh, were convicted of a homicide if they had been convicted under a mandatory minimum statute. And then a couple of years later in Montgomery, the ruling was made retroactive. Um, so um, <clears throat> my work really um, developed, my passion for life sentence reform really developed out of that original survey work. Uh, 
Um, so that I've talked a little bit about the juveniles. I can tell you about the adults and all the data that we've collected on the adults shows us that now one in seven people in prison is serving a life sentence. Um, this has been a nearly five times increase since the 1984 account. And if we include what's called virtual lifers, people who are serving a m minimum of 50 years or more, um, this brings it up to 206,000 people serving a life sentence in the United States. To put this in some sort of international context, we are 4% of the world's population, but we are 40% of the lifer population. And most of the rest of the world calls a lifer somebody who gets out after 15 years uh, or so. We consider lifers at a minimum to be uh, 25 years, but there's a significant portion of them, 50,000 or so, who will never get out. They have what's called life without the possibility of parole. Um, we have had a rate of growth in life sentences that surpasses even the rate of growth of our overall prison population. So it's a household term practically now that we have mass incarceration. Um, it's an issue that most Americans agree is unsustainable and immoral. It's expensive and it does no benefit to public safety to incarcerate our way out of crime problems. But even though we've had some um, uh, receding of the prison population in the past few years, the lifer population has continued to soar. And so um, within our prison population, the reforms that we're considering making are really not even beginning to address those at the, at the deep end of the system, the life-sentenced individuals. Um, <clears throat> I, in our book, we go through a number of explanations for why we have life sentencing in the United States and why it's been expanded to such an extreme. And a lot of the explanations that we provide are those same ones that we hear about criminal justice uh, problems uh, generally, mandatory minimums, habitual offenders, and the abolishment of parole are really the main drivers. And those are the main drivers of mass incarceration, but the worst consequence of those has been on people serving life sentences. The elimination of parole that occurred in seven states and also um, the federal government was part of this whole tough on crime era of the 1980s where the idea was that we could build our way out of a crime problem. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example of Georgia. So the state of Georgia has life without parole, and it also has life with parole. Um, in 1994, until 1994, a life with parole sentence in the state of Georgia was seven years. That sounds like a walk in the park today, but that was standard in the United States in the 1990, it, it, up in the early part of the century and the mid part of the century. In 1995, the legislature decided to double this, and they made it 15 years. Um, in, two, in 2006, the legislature again uh, doubled it and made it 30 years. So now it's a 30-year mandatory minimum on a life sentence with the possibility of parole um, in the state of Georgia. That's one of the harshest, but not the harshest. The harshest life with parole sentence is actually in the state of Tennessee. Um, where a case is actually pretty, um, uh, getting a lot of press right now, maybe those who follow this or gen criminal justice reform are familiar with the case of Centoya Brown. So she's actually up for um, uh, review uh, after only 51 years of incarceration. She came to prison um, after committing a crime at the age of 16. She was a sex trafficked juvenile and she killed one of her customers. Um, and she received life without the possibility of parole um, before a mandatory minimum of 60 years. The governor apparently is now, as we speak, considering all, what he says is all aspects of her case and the hope among advocates like ourselves um, at the sentencing project is that he will consider uh, giving her relief. So we'll probably know about that in a couple of years, but that's an example of um, uh, how, how out of 
touch we've gotten in terms of life sentences in the United States. That's life with the possibility of parole. Georgia also has thousands of people serving uh, life without the possibility of parole. Um, so in the book we talk about all the same policies that got us into this jam of mass incarceration as being the drivers of life sentencing as well. And we also spend a good deal of time talking about the death penalty. Um, <clears throat> so life sentences are really um, in an odd place. When it comes to reforms at the low end of the system, um, there's a real uh, incentive, right, because people who are nonviolent, first-time offenders, they're, they're um, more appealing to people who want to bring criminal justice reform. They seem non-dangerous, and they probably are um, not dangerous. So a lot of times what happens in, st in statutory reforms is that deals are made. Um, that in order to get um, reform to uh, nonviolent, low-level drug offenders, the reforms also have to be toughened at the deep end. We have to make sure that people who are serving life sentences never get out, um, or people who have committed sex offenses or homicides uh, never see the light of day. So deals are made in that regard. And then also on the death penalty um, reforms, we see you know, life without parole presented as the humane alternative. And so in that way, it's more cemented in as a sentence because it's determined to be really the only sentence we can consider in, it, in, um, in place of the death penalty. We argue in our book um, that you know, we oppose the death penalty. We say that out front and we oppose it uh, vigorously. But we also think that there are sentences other than life without parole that we could put on the table. Um, and that it doesn't just have to be between death penalty and life without parole, because when it really comes down to it, there isn't a lot of difference between the two sentences. Um, and so we spend a bit of time talking about how we could, um, you know, how we could reform the laws in, in that way and, and not make life without parole such a, such a uh, bargaining chip in both directions. Um, and so we make a recommendation in our book that all sentences uh, be capped at 20 years and that um, our main push is to lower life sentences down to a maximum of 20 years. And the reason for this is that that is what's done in the rest of the world. And the United States has this sort of sense of exceptionalism, well, in a lot of areas, but my expertise is in criminal justice, so I'll just stick with that. Um, and uh, that we, uh, you know, that we, we don't want to look at what other countries are doing. Even though they have far less crime, they have far fewer um, issues with uh, violence and crime than we do. We don't want to uh, see what other countries are doing. But for those of us who are willing to look at what other countries are doing, they are capping at 10 to 15 years. And they have had no public safety problem as a result. So we, we advocate for adopting some of those same processes here and for revisioning our criminal justice system and our correction system as one that's truly correcting people. Because if we really focus on correcting people, it really shouldn't take more than 20 years. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in some, ex some extreme um, circumstances, People, you know, for instance, if somebody is convicted of a, of a sex offense, a series of rapes, and they go through 20 years of incarceration and they refuse tra treatment for all 20 years, we would not advocate for their release. But for the most part, and I know Steve will spend a lot of time on this when he gives you the, the you know, narratives of people serving life sentences, they have taken it upon themselves with really no hope of release to improve their own lives. They are people who not only can get better, but in many instances have already gotten better. And they, um, we advocate for a second look at these folks. Not necessarily an automatic release, but a second look. So I think I'll, I'll close with that, um, but I'll say that we do offer a variety of interim recommendations. Uh, we are you know, among those that see that the US is probably not ready to adopt 20 years as a, as a cap on life sentences, so um, there are intermediate steps to get us there. Um, so I hope, I hope uh, you'll enjoy the rest of the conversation, and I'll hand it over to Steve. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging uh, some debts that I owe, and first uh, to the two women that I'm honored to share the stage with tonight. Uh, my book is focused on dynamics inside two 
prisons here in Washington State. One's the Washington State Reformatory. The other is the Twin Rivers Unit. They are both medium security men's prisons in Monroe. And so one way to read my book is it's just a story about two prisons in Washington. Uh, but, but through the work of Ashley, I think I can, I can strongly make the claim that I'm not telling just a Washington story or just a story of those two prisons, I'm telling a national story. Ashley's done a lot of work over the last several years documenting the growth of life sentences and without her establishing the relevance of my work, my work would be exceedingly less, uh, I'd be exceedingly less confident in the findings that I, that, I, that I was able to draw. And so I think I am telling a national story through the work of Ashley, even though it's only about two prisons in Washington. And with respect to Catherine, uh, I frequently heard the argument in recent years in, in the state of Washington, and perhaps other states as well, that we can't really focus political attention on life sentences in Washington because there's a worse penalty on the books. Uh, and the worst penalty, of course, is the death penalty. And many people would argue that until the death penalty is, is overthrown, we can't really talk seriously about life sentences. Well, in case you missed it, uh, the Washington State Supreme Court recently uh, ruled our death penalty unconstitutional. And they got to that conclusion largely through the work of Catherine and her colleague, Heather Evans, who demonstrated the rampant racial disparities in the way in which the death penalty is implemented in the state of Washington. So thank you, Catherine, for that work. And now my work's a lot more relevant. So thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to University Beyond Bars. Uh, which, as many of you may know, is a nonprofit organization that provides uh, college preparatory and college level instruction at two prisons in Monroe, primarily the Washington State Reformatory. Uh, and it was through uh, volunteering with UBB that I became aware of life sentences as an issue. Uh, through a partnership with UBB and the department that I chair, Law, Societies, and Justice, we began teaching courses inside the reformatory. And then I came to know many of, of the men that are suffering under these sentences, met men who had life, life without the possibility of parole or other, otherwise very long sentences. Uh, and I became very aware of this issue. So w w were it not for the work of UBB, I would never become interested in this and written this book. So thank you to UBB for all the great work that they do. I also want to acknowledge the 21 prisoners who agreed to be interviewed uh, by me for this book. Uh, each of the men that I interviewed has either a, a life without the possibility of parole or a virtual life sentence, as, as Ashley described. And each of them sat with me commonly for two or three times, uh, usually 60 to 75 minutes for each interview. Uh, and I asked them a lot of very difficult questions uh, about how they came to terms uh, with their life sentence, how they adjusted to life in prison, uh, how their health was, uh, and how they anticipated the possibility of dying inside prison. And so I, I forced the men to go into some very difficult emotional terrain, and I'm very honored that they chose to go there with me and, and share it as openly with me as they did. Uh, I was also able to interview staff at both of these prisons, because I wanted to tell a story not just about the adjustments that prisoners have to make to a life sentence, but also to look at the very real consequences of this growing uh, number of life sentence prisoners for the facilities that must house them. Um, as these prisoners are obviously going to age, they're going to decline, and they're ultimately going to die. And as that number of life sentence prisoners grows, you can just imagine the number of challenges that's, that the prison staff will have to, folk, uh, will have to face. And so I used interviews with staff to try to give some sense of what those challenges are and, and, how, they, and the, how they will grow and why we should be paying attention to them. So I don't have time, uh, limited time, so I'm not going to talk much about, the, I'm not going to talk at all about the staff side of things, but I do want to talk a little bit about the prisoners uh, and what their experience is like. Um, the title of my book is called Too Easy to Keep. And that's a riff off a term that you commonly hear in each of these prisons. And that term is easy keeper. An easy keeper, as you might imagine, refers to a prisoner who poses no obstacles to the smooth operation of the prison. In, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, these are prisoners who have a very established routine. Uh, they work commonly. They go to school. They are involved in various prison-run organizations. Uh, they, they, they treat uh, staff and fellow inmates with respect. They pose no, uh, they, 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 they never get into trouble. And, and not only are they not, not troublemakers, but often they're providing a lot of the stability inside the institution. Uh, and so several people I talked to talked openly about what an easy keeper was and how they knew who they were. And here's Isaac, a prisoner, talking about uh, how he can spot an easy keeper. He said, they just have a certain aura about them. When they're in the chow hall, they're usually pretty polite. 
They don't run around talking about other people. They have a set program, and you see what they're doing by their actions. You see they're not getting in trouble, they're not yelling at, co at the cops, being disrespectful, yelling at 10 o'clock nighttime, calling people crazy names. They're not saying all that. You can just tell a lifer, a guy who's done time, and a guy who hasn't. I think the biggest thing is the respect factor of it. It's very noticeable. So one of the things that was most striking as I talked to lifers was they talked about the transitions that they made, particularly those who came into prison when they were younger, uh, and how they shifted over time and how they matured. And one of the things that was most critical to, to many of them was the, the recognition that they existed in interdependent relationships with other people. As they got older, they recognized that. And they recognized that their actions necessarily had impacts on other people. Um, and many of them uh, recognized that and, and recognized that instead of perhaps being a negative influence in other people's lives, they could be a positive one. And here's another prisoner named Leonard, I call Leonard, talking about this. And he, Leonard was convicted at the age of 18 for a murder he, he, uh, he committed in, in, in conjunction with the robbery of a neighbor. Talking about his old self, he, I just didn't care about other people. I just cared about myself, what I could get for me. Everything was self-centered like that. That was the cause of it. When I committed my crime, I didn't think about the consequences or who I was hurting or anything like that. I just wanted some money. So I didn't really think about that kind of stuff. It was just all about me. Me, me, me. But then I realized it wasn't really about me and change started happening. So this desire to be a positive influence in people's lives combined uh, with the desire, the, the very strong desire that many of them felt to atone for their past transgressions led many of the lifers that I interviewed to, to seek to uh, be very actively engaged with other people inside the prison. And particularly, they focused a lot of attention on younger prisoners, those who had a, had a release date and who the, the, the easy keepers feared, who if they didn't change their behavior, they were gonna come back to prison again. And so many of the easy keepers devote a lot of time to trying to mentor and otherwise counsel uh, young people, young prisoners, to try to uh, avert their future criminality. And here's William, who's particularly involved in counseling, talking about this process. He said, I believe that I'm actually helping people understand themselves a lot better. Because people in this atmosphere wear a lot of masks. People in this atmosphere have been through a lot of abuse, sexual, all of it. I mean, the list goes on and on. And they thought it was their fault rather than the other person's fault. And because they thought it was their fault, they thought they was inadequate as an individual. They went through life acting out on this, on this bad behavior that happened in their lives. Once they shared and realized, I've seen men cry on my shoulder after explaining these things to them. And later in the interview, William talked about how satisfying this work was to, to him. He says, nothing brings about more joy for me than to see a guy change from angry and bitter to the human being that they need to be. And what, one of the things that's remarkable about the work that they do is they do it with no hope of release. Uh, none of the men that I talked to at the time that I talked to them had any plausible hope that they were going to be released. Uh, some of them actually have been released since I wrote the book, and I can tell you their stories later if you want. But at the time that I talked to them, none of them could plausibly say, I've got a legitimate shot at release. So they do this work uh, without any, any real recognition and without uh, any meaningful hope of release. And I hope in, 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 the, in the book to try to draw our attention to those stories that are otherwise ignored and to have us take those stories very seriously because I think if we do that, it leads us to, to the sort of conclusions that Ashley and Mark are making about the ways in which we should reconsider punishment policy. And I want to close uh, by putting uh, with some words of one of the more articulate men that I uh, interviewed. His name is Nate. And, uh, and talking about the importance of the work that he does and, and how we should allow that to impact us. So one of the things I did with all the men I interviewed as I asked them, if there's one thing about prison that you could change, what would that be? And Nate didn't hesitate for a second when I asked him that question. He said, it would be nice if they would say, you know what, since we see that people can change, what we're going to do, we're going to start treating people as if they can change. The belief that people have value and that they are redeemable that alone, I'm telling you, it would move mountains. It would move mountains. And uh, in my own, I'm going to slip into my own prose here for a second, that these mountains are not yet moving is hardly welcome news to easy keepers like Nate. 
Still, he remains undaunted. What do you do? We have to try to make believers out of them. It seems like it's a never-ending battle, but that doesn't mean give up. And it may not change even in my lifetime, but you can't give up, because then you really have wasted your time. But I think sooner or later, something's got to give. Something has to give. Thank you all. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here sharing the stage with these two fantastic authors. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about some research that I've been doing uh, on the proliferation of long and life sentences in Washington State. I've been doing this research uh, with my colleague Heather Evans um, and in partnership with the ACLU of Washington and also in partnership with both the Concerned Lifers Organization and the Black Prisoners Caucus at WSR, which is one of the two prisons that Steve was, um, was in doing his research. So um, the report we're hoping to have out in the spring, I'll just share a few, kind of preview a few of the key findings. Um, one of which has to do with the fact that in Washington state we tend to like to say, well, we're not like Mississippi, so we're doing all right, right? We're, we're not as bad as Louisiana or Oklahoma or someplace um, usually in the south. Uh, and so we feel, we feel good about that. Um, and in fact, if you looked kind of internationally, what you see is that if Washington state were a country, uh, there would only be four countries in the world that have higher incarceration rates than Washington state. Um, that's more than doubled since 1978, and one of the main drivers of that has been the proliferation of long and life sentences in Washington. In the report, but what we mean by long is anything over 10 years, we mean uh, 20 years and over for, as very long, and then life, um, we have a slightly different threshold, we're using 40 years or an actual LWAP sentence. So one of the things we're trying to do in the report is really figure out why they've proliferated um, as much as they have. And what we can say with certainty is that it isn't a function of crime trends. So if you compare data from 2015 with data from 1986, what you see is that there were 5% more violent crimes known to the police in 2015 than there were in 1986. But there were 330% more long and life sentences imposed in 2015 than in 1986. So it's not a function of crime, and 2015 was not an aberrational year, I didn't, that was just the last year in our time series. Um, so, so clearly it's been policy that's been driving this trend, and so what we do in the report is we try to identify the main drivers that are specific to Washington State. Ashley and Mark do a great job of talking about sort of general drivers that are very frequently involved across the country. Ours is focused on Washington State specifically. So I'll just really quickly mention those, I'm happy to talk about them more in the Q&A. And then I'm gonna pose some questions to Ashley and to Steve. Um, the context for these drivers is the, ad uh, the adoption of the Sentencing Reform Act in 1984. The Sentencing Reform Act itself did not call for longer sentences than what were previously imposed, but what it did do that was very significant is it abolished parole for most prisoners in Washington State. Um, I still meet people frequently who say, we don't have parole in Washington State. We don't for most prisoners. There are a few exceptions, but um, for the most part, most prisoners do not have a chance to make the case that they have matured and are safe to release. So that was kind of the context. And then the four main policy drivers really quickly would be, um, in our analysis, we find evidence that the three strikes law, of course, has played a significant role, particularly in increasing LWAPs. Um, and in fact, we find that about 72% of all LWAPs that have been imposed since 1995 were um, three strikes convictions. And many of those were convictions that did not involve homicide. Um, in 1995, the legislature adopted the Hard Time for Armed Crime Act, which is otherwise known as weapons enhancements. Most people don't have weapons enhancements uh, included in their confinement sentence, but for the people who do, they can add a tremendous amount of time. So it's not uncommon for us to see in our data, which include everybody sentenced from 86 to 2015 for a felony, uh, we commonly see that people have more time as a result of weapons enhancements than they do for the underlying offense. Um, so that's been an important factor as well. Um, one thing that I think has gotten less publicity, but it turns out in our analysis to be really important, is that the legislature has been tinkering with the sentencing grid. Our, in Washington, we have a determinate sentencing structure, and our sentences are based on the seriousness of your offense and then your offender score. And your offender score is a measure of the seriousness and length of your criminal record. 
but the rules that govern how you calculate that, that to how judges calculate that offender score keep changing. And they keep changing in a way that escalates the offender score, sorry. So in Washington State, for example, in 99, the legislature um, expanded its list of offenses that are triple scored, meaning they give you three points instead of one point as a prior offense. And then it double scored a bunch of those same convictions for juveniles. Um, and that's just one example of many, many such changes. So the offender scores are, are rising and that produces more long and life sentences. And then finally, one of the things we did not expect to see, and this isn't exactly a policy shift, but one consequence of these policy shifts is that the trial penalty has grown. So um, the, uh, the trial penalty refers to the gap between the sentence that's imposed at trial versus through plea agreements. And because there's so much leverage, prosecutors have so much leverage, more and more people are pleading guilty in the first place and not going to trial. And then when they do go to trial, um, the, the laws can be used to essentially penalize people who have exercised their constitutional right to trial. So the gap between what's typically imposed in a plea agreement versus at trial has more than doubled for people convicted of a violent offense. So that's also been an important driver. Um, I'm happy to say more about this. I could talk about it all night. Uh, but what I would really want to do now is pose some questions to you all. Um, and I think I'm going to do this from here, if that's all right with you. OK. So I'm going to start um, with you, Ashley. Um, one of the things I found really interesting in your book is that you note in your discussion of women who are serving LWAPs that many of those women have been involved in situations involving domestic violence prior to their own sentencing. And I was wondering if you could just unpack the connections for us a little bit there. Sure. So, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> should, be on. should be on, yeah. You can hear me? So women uh, make up about 3% of the lifer population um, in the country, and um, they are uh, often convicted of homicide. Um, and we know uh, from their stories, from narratives from women, um, that it's not uncommon to have killed um, either their abuser in a domestic violence situation or to have committed a homicide because of they were experiencing abuse at home. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when um, this happens in states where there's a mandatory life sentence upon conviction for a first or second degree murder, uh, there's, there can be really no um, accommodation for the fact that they were convicted of a crime that was uh, essentially a self-defense crime. Um, so women, you know, have been getting, um, uh, you know, growing in our criminal justice system uh, for some time. They're growing at a faster pace than men. And uh, this is not, um, you know, not an exception when it comes to life sentences. Uh, most of the data on women is really qualitative. Uh, in my surveys of the, uh, the censuses that I've done on life sentences, um, I don't ask uh, what motivated uh, their crime, um, but just uh, what the crime of conviction was. Uh, but that's definitely an area where I'd like to focus more because um, in the years that we've collected data on um, life sentences by gender, the rate of female lifers is um, uh, grown at two times the rate of male lifers. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, so um, you also interviewed staff and they spoke a lot about their awareness that the prison systems cannot accommodate the growing number of older folks who are living behind bars. Could you talk a little bit about what, what the issues are, what, what makes that so challenging and what the sort of structural and architectural limitations are. Yeah, it's, it's a especially uh, significant issue at the Washington State Reformatory. If you've ever been there, the prison was built in 1910. Uh, you really can't do anything uh, if you're a prisoner there unless you can go up and down stairs multiple times a day. Uh, and so uh, if you are mobility impaired at all, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll eventually be forced to, to leave the reformatory unless uh, you need dialysis, dialysis treatment. It's one of only two prisons in the state that offer dialysis, so they will make exceptions uh, for people who need dialysis who are mobility impaired. But otherwise, <clears throat> um, they're going to have to move. Uh, they can go to Twin Rivers as another alternative. Twin Rivers is a more modern prison, it's a newer prison. It does, and it has uh, no stairs on the campus, so you can move about on the campus. Uh, 
in a walker or a wheelchair, and they do have some living units there on one floor. But even there, it's, it's, it becomes very difficult. And the only facility that we have in the state of Washington that's really designed for people who have significant uh, health or mobility issues is a minimum security unit uh, in the middle of the state, uh, the SAGE unit at Coyote Ridge. Uh, but the problem there is because it's a minimum security unit, uh, if you have a life sentence, you're almost never going to be classified as minimum security, so you can't go there. And so what ends up happening is people who have dementia go to the special offenders unit, which is for individuals who have mental illness, not really designed for people that have uh, uh, dementia, or they go to the prison hospital, which is also not really designed for people who have dementia. Um, so I was telling, starting to tell Ashley a story at the beginning uh, when we were just saying hello to each other. When I first tried to get access to do this project, I met somebody who was uh, one of the chief medical officers uh, and the Department of Corrections, and once he figured out what I wanted to do, he was desperate for, to give me access. He was desperate for me to write this book because he recognizes better than anybody the sorts of challenges that the, the system faces as these prisoners grow older and begin to decline. Okay, thank you. Um, Ashley, you, you, note, you and Mark note in the book that there's nothing incompatible about um, uh, abolishing life sentences and sort of reallocating the monies that get saved in part toward um, prevention and victim services. Um, but I'm wondering how you would address someone who, or how you would respond to the idea that if you take away LWAP, particularly in a state that doesn't have the death penalty, that um, you know, some victims need closure, this is a way to get it, and that it would undermine victim well-being to do so. Um, yeah, so we do, uh, you know, spend a bit of time talking about, um, you know, the inadequate attention that's paid by the criminal justice system to victims of crime. Um, but we also um, feel that the prison system is not the right system to help uh, victims of crime. There are systems that are designed for that, but the criminal justice system is just not going to be able to do what victims want for it to do. Um, and uh, that there can be healing for victims and there can be healing for offenders. Um, there can be both. It doesn't have to be just one or the other where only one side gets better and the other side must suffer indefinitely. We can have um, a system that uh, pays enough attention to the people who have been harmed by crime, but also pays attention to the people who have done the harm. Um, it, uh, so we make the argument that that is a more humane way of, um, of administering justice than, um, than what we've done so far. Um, and so, you know, there is, you know, vic some victims are not going to be happy with that solution. Um, but some victims we know uh, have uh, come to the conclusion that um, they are freed when they, um, you know, try to see the, uh, the person who committed the crime as just a very broken individual and, um, you know, worthy of the same kinds of repair. Um, so, um, but yeah, we make the, you know, the argument that the money that um, would be saved by just incarcerating people for the rest of their lives at no benefit to public safety would then be used for victim compensation funds and, um, and prevention to, to, um, to areas where we know violent crime is rampant. Um, Steve, you, you talk a lot in the book about how, what the constructive role that the lifers or the easy keepers play in the life of the prison community, mentoring and supporting and, um, you know, negotiating truces and de-escalating conflicts and so many things. Um, do you ever worry that someone could read that and say, that's great, they're behind bars doing that work? <laughs> and how would you respond to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Um I do think many of the organizations in the University of Beyond Bars is one of them. I mean, the reality is that those programs do benefit from having people um, there a long time. Um, but I mean, getting to Ashley's point about um, a 20 year maximum, it wasn't that long ago that if you committed a murder in the United States, you would serve a term of about 14 or 15 years. 
uh, which makes sense, and that's, uh, I mean, I think that's a significant amount of time, and still would allow someone who's on this transition um, as they're maturing uh, to play a very positive role in the prisons that house them. Um, so I do think um, there still will be people uh, that they're serving significant chunks of time, uh, and they will be undergoing the process that I described in the book. So I still think a lot of good work could still get done if we had fewer lifers. Great. Um, I guess maybe just a couple more and then we'll open it up. But um, Ashley, you and Mark obviously spent a lot of time talking about the very uh, extreme level of racial disparity that characterizes life sentences in particular. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the many factors that help produce those racial disparities? Sure. So, um, uh, you know, the entire criminal justice system is, um, you know, disproportionately represented by people of color, especially African Americans. And that's also true with life sentences. So, um, lifers um, uh, are about 50% African American, and two thirds of lifers are people of color. And um, I guess to us, most striking is the fact that one of every five black people in prison has a life sentence. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that work to create that, um, to create that statistic. Um, uh, one of them is uh, the habitual offender laws um, and the sentencing laws that make it um, such that uh, when an African American comes before a judge with a crime for which he might get life sentence, he is much more likely to have two felonies that um, predate that crime. Uh, and he's much more likely to have, or she is much more likely to have had multiple encounters with, the, with law enforcement to have a long criminal record uh, because of the policies and also because of structural disadvantages um, that make it uh, more difficult for people of color to move up and out of communities of violence and poverty um, and, uh, you know, very few means of legitimate employment. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, life sentences, you know, that's some of the explanation for why we see so many, um, so many people of color ending up with a life sentence. Okay, thank you. Steve, and uh, both of you actually write about this, but I guess I'll direct my question to you, Steve, and that is, you note that um, we as a country decided to impose a lot more life sentences precisely at the same time that conditions inside prison changed very dramatically, and that's a, a very um, poor fit. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the people you interviewed experienced those changes. They've probably been around, many, some of them at least, have been around long enough to have lived through those changes and what kinds of challenges do they create for them as they're living their, their life sentence? Yeah, one of the points I, I didn't make in the, the, the few minutes I had earlier was to, to highlight the, the, the number of obstacles that uh, prisoners have to face and, and it makes their stories of transformation all the more remarkable uh, when you consider those. Um, and I guess to a point that Ashley made earlier, particularly if you have a life sentence or a long sentence, you're, you're less likely to be able to get into various programs. One of the great things about UBB is that because it's not a Department of Corrections program, it doesn't have to abide by those sorts of restrictions, and so they welcome uh, people of, of, of varying sentence lengths. But many of the DOC programs, uh, and it makes sense from their perspective that they're, if they're, they're creating a program that's designed to reduce someone's chance of, of, of committing a crime in the future, that you would prioritize them. If lifers aren't, getting, gonna, aren't going to get out, then why would you give them drug counseling or that sort of thing? Um, and so both the, the sort of shift away from rehabilitation as a guiding philosophy of punishment and the growth of life sentences has made it much harder uh, for lifers uh, to uh, engage in programs that provide meaning to them, which again, I think makes their stories uh, all the more remarkable. Okay, I've got one more. Um, Ashley, I was really struck um, that you and Mark chose in your recommendations to recommend the 20 year maximum sentence. Um, one might have expected you to recommend instead life with the possibility of parole. And I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit about that decision and why that is not the direction you, you chose to go in. Sure, so life with the possibility of parole um, is a sentence that um, 
110,000 people or so have around the U.S. And <clears throat> it, it historically was a sentence that um, was, uh, like Steve said, around 10 to 15 years. Uh, the federal system uh, used to cap life sentences um, at around seven or eight years, and so did the state of Louisiana, which has um, just a just a mind-boggling number of people serving life sentences and has no parole anymore. Um, but over the years, life with parole has been very politicized. Um, so more people are getting life with parole. And the extension of, of the wait time before parole, like I explained with Georgia, um, is, is very common across the US. So, um, you know, we used to hear life sentences being 25 to life um, as fairly common, California in particular, and, and many states, life was, life was 25 to life. Um, but in states like Georgia and Tennessee, it's now 30 years or 50 years. Texas is 40 years. Um, uh, the, the wait time before your first parole is so long that life without parole really has become life without parole. And the other uh, issue with life with, with parole is um, how politicized the parole board process has become and the board membership has become. So um, in many states, um, folks are, are unwilling to take a chance on a lifer because of um, you know, the rare instances where a lifer gets out and commits another heinous crime. You know, Polly Klass um, in California and um, uh, Willie Horton, um, you know, those are, those are memories that, that we're going to, uh, you know, hold forever. And um, so those are very rare, um, but they, they do happen. And so uh, policymakers, they just, and governors, they don't want that on their hands if they are to release a parole, a lifer. So um, it's very unlikely that lifers, much more unlikely that lifers with parole actually get parole. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. We have a microphone here and one over there. Uh, we are doing a recording, so we do need you to use the mics if you have a question. Um, so come on up and, uh, yeah. Are there uh, places either in the United States or other places in the world where there just aren't set times and it's totally up to the judge to decide whether it's two years or life or, or something and there aren't these matrices and other things that you were describing? And if yes or no, would you, what would you think of? I know there's a lot of problems with that, but is that really the direction it should be going in? I think a lot would have to change in our country's view of criminal sentences for us to, you know, use a system like that. But it does; ha it is the way it is in, in other countries. Um, I think in Norway, which is where um, uh, there is a, a mass murderer serving a life sentence, um, he cannot be there longer than 21 years. Um, uh, but the 21 is even, I think, um, indeterminate. It's just a max of, of 21. So there's, um, he, he could be confined civilly after that. Um, but, um, you know, that, that uh, is certainly something that some countries do, where they consider that person to just be a work in progress, you know, and there, there isn't um, a mandatory minimum determinate sentence. Okay. You want to say Excuse me, uh, Steve, you started talking about uh, that, that anecdote from the chief medical officer at the prison, how they're really grappling with this reality that they have an aging prison population that's expensive for the state, uh, resource intense. Um, I'm curious if you could unpack maybe, is that a common, <clears throat> excuse me, is that a common view amongst uh, prison workers, wardens, both in Washington on a national level? Uh, do they realize that's an unsustainable problem or are they 
a little less sensitive to that issue? Yeah, I think it depends in part on where you are in the bureaucracy. Uh, the people that work in headquarters uh, are very aware that they've got a problem. And in fact, when I was talking to, with this chief medical officer, he said, we, 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 ha we have begun a conversation with the legislature about building a new prison because uh, they looked at their numbers and they're going to have to build a new prison. It's going to have to be a prison that can accommodate people with dementia or otherwise have to struggle, struggle dealing with their you know, day activity, act, daily activities. Um, and so at that level, um, yeah, there's significant awareness. The superintendent at Monroe was very happy that I was. So I think the higher you are in the hierarchy and the, the, the bigger the picture you have, uh, the more you can see this. Uh, as you get down to the custody level officer, their, their view is a little bit more constricted. Uh, and many of them, you know, have sort of strong moral opinions about the nature of the people that are there and the crimes that they've committed and think that they, that they owe the state a s significant amount of time. So, so at the higher levels, yes, they're very aware of the problem. Um, but I think it's, uh, just how widespread that view is, I'm not sure. But I think, again, those that are able to foresee the future see very significant challenges ahead. Thanks. Sure. Hi there. Thanks all so much for coming. So you mentioned that it sounded like educating people that were never getting out of prison would be a good idea. So how would you articulate that and maybe how would you measure it? Um, well, you could, you could make a, a couple of different arguments. I mean, you could make a moral argument, uh, getting to, to Ashley the way Ashley framed it earlier, right? We're all in a state of becoming. And even if we're incarcerated, it doesn't mean that we've lost any of those rights to self-actualization that all of us arguably possess. Uh, so you can make a moral argument. Uh, you could make a prag more pragmatic argument uh, to the extent that prisoners are actively engaged in constructive activity. Uh, they make their prisons easier to run. Uh, so just in terms of, 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 of the everyday functioning of the prison, um, you know, there, there's, there's reasons to find constructive outlets for people's energies. And to the extent that, you know, some, some of these people will get out uh, one way or the other, uh, and if they do get out, if they've had some exposure to education, if they've seen the world from a range of different perspectives, uh, then I think their capacity to deal with the, the, the myriad of challenges that they're going to face are enhanced the more education that they've had. You kind of mentioned that people look to the lifers as kind of the, there's a life as they set a culture to the prison. So do they kind of set the culture if they change a little bit too? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, I, and I do think that uh, getting to Isaac's quote, you know, you know his, from his pers perspective, he can sort of detect an easy keeper just by the way he carries himself. And a lot of them are very active in University Beyond Bars. They're active in the Concerned Lifers Organization, Brack Prisoners Caucus, a lot of the organizations that are trying to do a lot of very constructive activity. And, and yes, many of the younger prisoners very much look up to those guys. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hi, this, uh, I, this is a two-part question because, Ashley, I'm hoping you can clarify. Are you recommending against parole simply for a 20-year maximum with no parole? Uh, no. So in our book, we recommend that there be some um, decision-making body, like a parole system, um, that after 15 years begins to review the individual and the anticipation is that they would be released after 20. It's not I always see. the way, but that's the, that would be the governing assumption, which is the way it is in other countries. The assumption is they're coming out after a certain period of time and the job of the prison is to get them ready for that release. So gotcha. yes, we would definitely want some sort of uh, decision-making body that was composed of experts. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> that's a great idea. Uh, the, the other thing I want to ask about is victims. Um, and that's the, the role of victims in parole hearings and clemency hearings. Um, we often see, right now, since we don't have parole clemency, the clemency process is about the only way out of prison. And Often uh, victims will come and and uh, be you know advocating for the guy to stay in prison forever. Thirty years after the crime was committed, and so this is sort of a delicate question because we we 
you know, feel like victims deserve everything and all the care that we can give them. But we ask these guys to heal in prison to, you know, fix what's wrong with them. And is there, is, what role do you think uh, victims have in determining whether a guy should stay in prison? And also, can we ask, is there a statute of limitations or a time when a victim has, okay, enough already? Um, so. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a tricky issue. Um, you know, it, it sounds very harsh, but I don't, you know, I try to make the connection sometimes between, you know, the, this issue and if we were treating somebody with cancer, you know, and if, if there's somebody with, with cancer, um, you know, we don't ask um, all the other people who have been affected by cancer how to fix cancer. We ask a doctor. Um, and so in the same vein, we have to rely on experts about when to release people, not the people who are too close to it uh, play a valuable role but shouldn't play a role in that, in the, in public safety, in determining public safety. I was just going to add something really quick to that, which is um, I read a really useful article recently and the distinction they drew is that um, their position was that it makes a lot more sense to have victim input at the time of sentencing, but if the point of the post-sentence review process, whatever that, whatever we call that, is to evaluate what the person has done with their time, right, you're not relitigating the crime, then unless the victim has direct information about how the prisoner has conducted him or herself during their confinement, then other, you know, outside of that, or, or would like to make certain requests about certain conditions of release, including contact, those would be things that where the victim could have input. But other than that, the focus should be on what the person has done while confined. And that's not something that the victim has any particular insight into in most cases. So that was their position, and that made a lot of sense to me. I think it's a useful way of thinking about it. Another uh, individual who has voice at both of those stages is the prosecutor. And I think you say the same things about the prosecutor that Catherine just said about victims. Um, so it looks like we have five, five more questions. I'm just going to call it at that. We have time for those five. So earlier this year, I helped a gentleman win his freedom after 23 years down at WSRU and other places. Um, seeing the clemency and pardon board process working in or not working in Washington with an ultimate appeal to a governor in a political world is asking for, you know, at least minimal um, production, if nothing else. So when we have mass incarceration and we need to evaluate hundreds and thousands of offenders, as they're called, or inmates, or prisoners, or students, whatever they are in there. Um, we need to think on such a different scale than what we have operating. And though we won't look to European and other systems that may generate some good ideas, it'd be great to have, you know, at least best practices widely, um, you know, spread around what's working in other states, at least for starters. But that's like the tail end of the system, right? We have such a monstrosity on our hands from juvenile justice to kicking kids out of school for not showing up to school or whatever. So I just find this problem so huge and it's so political and people don't care that much. For a two million plus city for this kind of venue, this should be packed, right? Criminal justice is the new you know, item, I thought. But it's so hard, it's such a tough nut, and uh, I don't even know if there's a question in there in either response. Hi there. I was hoping if you could, I was hoping that you'd be able to possibly share some of your opinions about the root causes to the root causes that you um, mentioned about the proliferation of um, life sentences, like the the root causes of those changes to the um, to the to the prisoner scores, um, to the rise of mass incarceration in general. Like, do you do you feel it's private interest or 
changes to public interest uh, or how we regard rehabilitation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of those things. I think, you know, certainly um, the abandonment of rehabilitation in the correction system was a huge player. Um, you know, the declaration of the war on drugs accelerated mass incarceration. It didn't cause it, but it certainly added to it. Um, and a lot of the uh, rhetoric that followed in the 1980s and 90s that was uh, generated from a legitimate rise in crime um, and legitimate worries about crime, but was addressed um, in a way that didn't, uh, didn't consider uh, the, the input of any experts in the field whatsoever. Um, all of that played a role in creating this climate that allows the public, you know, to live with the fact that one in seven prisoners has a life sentence and um, not really be terribly concerned about it. So, you know, we've become sort of, um, it's become normalized that we are such an extreme punisher in the world. But, uh, you know, at the same time, we try to be a human rights leader of the world. And those two don't really fit together when you really think about it. Um, so those would be some of the root causes of the root causes that I could come up with. I'll just add two more to that list of many root causes. Um, I would add the history of kind of racialized um, crime discourse and practice in this country and racialized violence, which I think kind of set the stage and made it easy to, easier to shift into that kind of uh, that approach on steroids um, because there's a long history of it. Um, and then I think the other piece is that it's very tempting. I think there's a widespread desire to believe that the world is um, very clean and simple and black and white. Things are black and white and we can divide the world up neatly into victims and perpetrators and we can just get mad at the people who do bad things and ignore the fact that many bad things have, it, have happened to them and that there's structural violence in their lives as well as interpersonal violence in their lives. And I think our desire to have it be neat and clean also makes us want to grab onto solutions that reflect that, that simplicity and don't take into account the underlying complexities of the situation. Thanks. So Steve almost answered my question earlier completely. <laughs> um, my husband is a person serving LOOP at Monroe, and Steve and Catherine both know my husband. And um, he and I have often talked about how prosecutors being involved in clemency hearings is kind of setting this new expectation that they have to be involved for anyone to be granted clemency. And I was just wondering if you have looked at that across Washington State and have you noticed patterns, any of you, or nationwide? Thank you. I have. Well, I think I'm I, I didn't understand. Okay, I, th I, think, <laughs> I think I have the most to say about this. Because um, <laughs> I read a paper once that I didn't do, but I read it. Um, two, there were two graduate students at UW who actually um, did an analysis of clemency hearing outcomes. And one of the factors that they included in their model was whether, what the position of the prosecutor was. And the two things that mattered most they found were what the position of the prosecutor was and whether it was a homicide or not. So basically, if you have homicide, if you're, you were convicted of homicide and the prosecutor in your case does not support clemency, you're almost certainly not going to get clemency. Um, and then the opposite, the most likely scenario would be it wasn't homicide and your prosecutor either doesn't oppose or supports the clemency petition. But the upshot is, yeah, I think that there's pretty uh, solid evidence that the role of prosecutors is very consequential in clemency outcomes. Yeah, especially with the prosecutor that's on the clemency board. Uh, he seems to be very, very concerned about what the prosecuting, and, and, and just as an example of a prosecuting attorney who we think, well, I shouldn't speak for Catherine, but uh, who goes about things perhaps uh, in the wrong way is our prosecuting attorney, uh, Dan Satterberg, and the way he approaches any clemency case is he asks himself, if this person were convicted of this crime today, what would be his sentence? And if the answer to that question is the sentence today would be less than the sentence he's serving, then he'll support the clemency uh, petition. If it's not, then he won't, uh, which is, has the virtue of consistency, and there's some logic to it, uh, but it's not what clemency is meant to acknowledge. The clemency statute says, has this person undergone extraordinary transformation? Now, the word extraordinary is a difficult word, and, and the, the board wrestles with it, but the board, to its credit, actually wrestles with that word. Uh, 
but Satterberg uh, doesn't really engage with that, and, and it makes a certain amount of sense, because then he, if he was gonna do that, he'd really have to look at the circumstances of the individual, what have they done, have they changed, et cetera, et cetera, and I can understand why that's not a burden he really wants to assume, but then that gets back to the more general question, should the prosecutor have much of a voice at all? Um, you all talked a lot about the structural um, basis for this proliferation of um, long and life sentences um, over the last, I believe, since the 80s, you all talked about. Um, and I'm curious, you alluded a little bit to like the war on drugs and drug crimes, and I'm curious about the difference between a lot of this conversation around life and long sentencing is talked about in public discourse with regard and respect to um, violent offenses, but I'm curious if you could speak a little bit to nonviolent drug offenses and how they're also playing into and in what ways they might be playing into this structural rise in long and life sentences. So um, there's about 17,000 uh, people serving life sentences uh, with, uh, for a nonviolent offense. Um, and 5,000 of those are for a drug offense, life without parole. Um, the majority of those are in the federal system. That's where you see the most um, nonviolent drug offenses that end up with a life without parole um, sentence. Um, and so it definitely affects everybody, right? So 17,000 is, is not an inconsequential number. Um, and that happens in states like Mississippi. Uh, there's a fair number of nonviolent uh, drug offenders that end up with life without parole because of um, you know, mandatory laws that count the quantity of drugs or that focus on habitual offender laws. So um, a third time drug offender could end up with life without parole. Um, you know, the, the majority of the people who end up with a life sentence are there for a serious crime. But because of the expansion of life sentences in the US, it sweeps in people across the spectrum um, from violent to nonviolent. So this is a, a less academic question, and we've touched on it a little bit, but in my reading and talking with people about this issue, I find, as I am sure you all do as well, that it's such a vast problem and it's so rooted in our long-term racism and all of our structures, and, and we really have become desensitized to these really long punishments. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, in your talking with people, who mostly have very limited basic knowledge and, and often really don't care um, in a lot of senses, what has been effective for you? Um, certainly we want people to attend to research, but also they are constituents of these lawmakers who are tough on crime and often don't really get questioned about it. And I guess I'm wondering what, what have you found effective for people who have really basic or limited knowledge about it to get them you know, one step closer to where we want them to be? Uh, one of the things I do in my introductory level class uh, at UW is I show videos from Concerned Lifers organizations uh, meetings where prisoners are speaking. Uh, and I think for many of my students that's a very significant event because they haven't really ever thought about what a prisoner's like or who, uh, you know, who they are, or what they sound like, what they look like. And so when they see an individual talking very articulately, very intelligently in a very well-informed way, uh, that just completely shatters their understanding of who these individuals are. And so I think that that's the most effective thing if, 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 if people can have exposure to these individuals and realize that even if they've committed a horrible transgression in the past, that that doesn't fundamentally define who they are. They're actually the best spokespeople uh, for this cause and, and I think uh, to the extent that their stories can be more widely heard, uh, I think that's a very, very positive way to go. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the lifer stories themselves that change hearts and minds. Um, you know, uh, there, there's, we, we have six profiles in our book about people serving life or their loved ones dealing with a life sentence um, of their son, a son or daughter or whatever. And, um, you know, that kind of humanizing 
aspect of it seems to have the most impact. Um, but it's an uphill battle. I mean, behind all of that for many people is the fact that they committed a serious crime. So, thank you. All right, thank you all so much again. Let's thank our guests. Um, Ashley and Steve are going to be signing out in the lobby. Elliot Bay has books for sale, and thanks, thanks to you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to have breakfast? Or no? Oh, okay.